membrane systems. We know we talked about, you know, the regular in the plants we have to clean because systems get dirty and we can develop problems either from a micro standpoint or from soil buildup. And it's much the same in membranes. Um, we have to clean number one because the law says we have to. We have to clean systems in the plant as frequently uh, as necessary to maintain uh, safe quality products that you're going to produce. Okay, so when we clean, we want to return any membrane plant from membrane standpoint to their original capacity. The thing that's mainly different about membranes as opposed to other systems in your plant is is kind of obvious is we can't really uh, open up a membrane and inspect it for um, success or failure in cleaning. We have to kind of take it as a leap of faith and we can look at certain, um, if there's certain aspects of the system we can look at to judge whether or not we were successful. And we're gonna talk about those in, in more detail. Um, of course, you wanna clean so you don't damage the membranes. If you pack soil into them and keep pounding them and pounding them, you can overpressurize them and and get uh, irreversible damage to the membrane and, and then you'd have to change out your membranes. So there's a number of different reasons, but the main thing is to return the plant to its original capacity so you can process safe quality bacteria, uh, safe or, or free food the following day. So whether or not you run that system eight hours or you run it 18 hours, uh, there's, a, there's always a time where we have to take the system down and clean it. And we're gonna talk about what is involved in developing the cleaning program and all the factors that go into a successful clean. The membrane cleaning, when you clean a membrane system, it's process driven, okay? There's a number of different things we have to know and we're gonna get into each one of them, but mainly you need to know your system, right? You need to know, obviously, whether you're dealing with a reverse osmosis or an RO system or a UF system, um, because we don't wanna be putting chlorine into the wrong one, all right? Hopefully, uh, the people that have been following along uh, can realize there's more to membrane systems than just putting your chemical in and measuring your pH. Uh, more seasoned uh, account managers will know how to look at the system hydraulics and gauge whether or not the system is functioning properly. And we're gonna review a little bit of hydraulics today as it relates to the specific CIP of the systems as well. You also should be aware of your feed stream because membrane systems don't like upsets, they like consistency. So you need to have a good quality feed stream and also uh, review, it should be a, one of the account manager's standard practices would be to review not only CIP sheets, but production sheets periodically with a membrane system. And again, we're gonna also talk uh, about ways that we can determine if the membranes are clean or not in doing the clean water fluxes or looking at the hydraulics and the pressure drops in the system. We will talk about that as well. So membrane cleaning, um, in order for effective cleaning, it, there's a balance required. Everybody's aware of the, if you've taken or, uh, the hydrate sanitation class, the four by four, or the five by five cleaning approach. And one of those sides is how the, the different cleaning factors all relate to one another. You have time, temperature, concentration, and mechanical action, okay? We didn't list time on here because uh, Mark is gonna be talking about time and some new things that we have done to look in and reassess what is effective cleaning time. But basically a membrane systems are different in that they have very strict limitations of exposure to pH, exposure to temperature, and exposure to certain chemicals, especially oxidizers. So there's like a sweet spot in there that we have to hit in order to have effective cleaning, whether it's an acid wash between pHs 1.8 to 2.2 or an alkaline wash between 10.8 and 11.2 and certain temperatures we need to hit. We need to make sure we're not cleaning too cold. We're not cleaning too hot because too high of a temperature can damage the membranes. Too cold of temperature, of course, uh, will have ineffective cleaning. And then, of course, if you are using chemicals such as chlorine or any type other types of oxidizers, those concentrations have to be monitored um, to make sure that they're in the effective range. If they're too high, they can damage the membranes. If they get used up in the process of cleaning, they need to have incremental additions made to the system in order to make sure the cleaning is effective. So as Mark put this slide together, you can see that you can't just hit the start button on the CIP of membranes and walk away and come back later and have it all be done. It requires a diligent operator. And one of the things it requires not only a diligent operator, but an effective pH meter that's been calibrated with fresh buffers generally on a daily basis and a log cap. So all these things have to happen in order to achieve an effective clean. Now, how many of you account managers out there can shake your head and go, yeah, you know, how many of you guys know account managers that, that your customers 
that have to clean like five or six units at one time, right? Or they got to do numerous other things. So how often are they are they able to devote the required attention to the unit to assure an effective clean day after day? That's a constant challenge. It's a struggle. We have to build a program that can handle the day-to-day the -day upsets or variations. And we'll talk about different types of chemistry and different, different philosophies of cleaning from commodity versus built products as well. So that being said, in order to develop an effective cleaning program for membranes, we have to generally look at eight different factors. Um, we just don't pull chemicals off the shelf and put them in and get out a pH meter to figure out how much to add. We have to take in consideration the membranes that are being cleaned because that's going to dictate what type of chemistry we can use. Uh, case in point, the difference between a UF and an RO. Very, very different um, and different chemicals need to be used to clean either one. The soil, that's deposited, okay? We're obviously not going to take an RO, an RO system that processes lactose permeate and um, clean it with probably a caustic wash right off the bat. Maybe we will, but for the most part, we have to know what the soil is. If it's mainly a mineral soil, you're gonna have an acid-centric or you're gonna focus on acid cleaning of the system. If you have a lot of proteins, then you're gonna focus on alkaline cleaning. Time, that's what everybody wants to save. So Mark, at the end, in his end of this presentation, is gonna talk about some advances we've made um, in, in challenging the time it takes to clean membranes. And I don't want to steal his thunder, so I'll let him expound upon that. But if you haven't heard it already, it's very interesting stuff. It's going to make us reevaluate how long it takes to clean membrane systems. Temperature, again, the membrane manufacturers limit the temperature that can be used to clean membranes. So they usually have high end limits, but also too low is, is, is bad as well. And we'll talk about kind of some reaction connect, uh, kinetics with chemistry reacting with soil and how that's dependent on temperature. Water, water's the hugest part of the cleaning uh, equation because it makes up about 99% of the cleaning solution. We need to have a good water supply, we'll touch on that. And then of course the chemistry, that's where your membrane group comes in. Um, if you have any questions on the chemistry, um, you have plenty of resources to reach out to. And then the personnel that operate the membrane system. Okay, that's another important factor. Are they properly trained? Do they know what they're doing? Do they know how to solve problems? And then finally, the eighth factor would be the hydraulics. And of course, these are in no particular order. They're all important. Um, but the hydraulics of a system, um, if you can understand how to look at a system to determine whether or not you have proper flows, it's going to make troubleshooting the system and, and, and um, your ability to keep it operating as designed um, a whole lot easier. Um, but one of the things that we want to always note though, hydrite sells chemicals and we sell expertise. If you find a system or if we encounter a system that has potential hydraulic issues, um, you want to alert the membrane crew, uh, in, in particular Felicity and Carl, because the hydraulics are set by the OEMs and typically, you know, for a certain reason. So we tend not to make broad blanket statements about changing the hydraulics on a system without consulting the OEM. So if there's anything that's, you know, chemistry is our wheelhouse, and if they're improperly using chemical, we make all those recommendations all day long, but when it gets into the system and the hydraulics, we like to bring in the people that design the system along with the customer and have a coordinated effort. That's one of the things that was very important to mention. Um, we just don't wanna be telling people, go ahead and increase the speed of that pump or do this or that. Um, if there's any questions of that nature, hopefully, one of us from the membrane team has already been involved and, uh, and can have those resources to get that done. All right, so going through the eight factors we just talked about, membrane configuration. Don't wanna spend much time on this um, because I think it's hopefully is pretty obvious, but basically the type of membrane is gonna dictate a lot of how we're going to clean the system. Most of the membranes we run into are the standard membranes that can tolerate uh, 120, 125 degrees CIP temperature. There are some uh, membranes coming on the market. More and more, we're seeing them used more and more are the high temperature membranes, um, but I have not seen a lot of those yet. Membranes generally have similar upper and lower pH and concentration limits. Um, low pH on the membrane specs from the membrane suppliers would be two. Some customers like to stretch that a little bit down to 1.8. Um, and the upper limits are generally around 11, uh, although some manufacturers, memory manufacturers, tighten those limits up a little bit. But generally, that's standard. 2 to 11 are the upper and lower uh, target ranges, a uh, little bit playing around the edges there. And then oxidizer compatibility, of course. What's an oxidizer? The two most common ones, sodium hypochlorite or sanaking bleach, liquid chlorine bleach, 
or hydrogen peroxide. The only ones that can tolerate limited exposure to oxidizers are MF and UF membranes. ROs and nanos, they typically allow zero, zero uh, contact with zero ppm oxidizers because uh, those are thin film composite membranes. When you have an RO and a nano, there's a thin film on top that is very susceptible uh, that, uh, to oxidizer dis uh, destruction. Flow rates and pressure differentials. Okay, those are very, very important and uh, plays in with pressures as well. ROs and nanos tend to operate at higher baseline pressures. Remember, that's the driving force to filter uh, stuff to create permeate to come through the membranes. Those can run anywhere in the 300 to 600 PSI range. Typically, some go higher. That's generally what, what in, in our world, what we're gonna see, um, unless you have a, a high pressure unit. And then flow rates and pressure differentials. Just as a review, how do you calculate the pressure differential in a membrane system? Basically, everybody, you should have your notes. You take your loop pressure minus your baseline pressure, and then you divide that by the number of membranes in each vessel in that stage. So typically a RO might have uh, five membranes, a UF might have four membranes or three, it depends, but if you take that pressure differential between baseline and, and the loop or the stage and divide by the number of membranes, and you should have a number generally around 10 to 15 PSI. Um, the greater the thickness of the flow spacers in the membrane, generally the higher that number can be, but as a general rule of thumb, 10 to 15 PSI, if you calculate that number for each one of your stages and you get that type of a number, generally your hydraulics and your flow are good. And I've gotten ahead of myself because that's more in the hydraulic section, but I want to make sure I mention that twice because that's one of the most important things as far as the success or failure of cleaning the membranes is to have proper cross flow. But again, in the red, as the red says at the bottom of the slide, always refer to the manufacturer's guidelines and make sure uh, for warranty purposes that we're adhering to those uh, restrictions. Another very important factor is water supply. Um, like as I mentioned earlier, water can be about 99% of your cleaning solution. So it's, a, it's critical to have a, a, a quality water supply. So soil can be deposited from two things. It can be deposited from the product that you're processing during the processing of whatever product that they're, they're, that they're making, or you can deposit soil from the water you use to clean the membrane. So typically in, in most of the, most of the main customers that are cleaning membranes today have polished cow water that they're using. It, it is um, low in mineral content. It is considered soft. It's uh, generally treated and uh, with, with a biocide or UV light to control a micro. And it's a generally a very good quality water. Um, however, how many people here would have a, a customer where you have cow water, but sometimes throughout the day they run out and have to switch to city water. So what I wanna say from this is if they do have a, um, the possibility of, if, of introducing city water into cleaning their membrane systems, it is a very good idea to have their water tested once or twice a year so that if they do go on city water, we may need to have to alter the cleaning program to, uh, to uh, account for changes in the water quality. One particular uh, example I can note is in California, they've had a drought, you know, the last five years, whatever. I mean, they've come out of it recently somewhat, but the water tables lowered. And so there was a major customer of ours that was getting a lot of clay and silt coming up through their water supply and depositing on their membranes. Um, and it was a real challenge. And um, they were able to work through that. And ultimately, I think what the long-term plan was is to put in more cow water so, uh, storage so they didn't run out and have to use well water. So be aware that it's not just the soil that can impact the system. It's not just the soil from the, what they're processing. It can also come from the water. The next slide is just for reference for everybody. It is a chart that lists the uh, water requirements or the requirements for the water supply for cleaning membranes and it splits it up between mfs and ufs which are a little more tolerant and nfs and ros and it has all the particular contaminants of concern and their maximum contaminant levels um, one of the things that i'd like to point out down below is the very bottom uh, parameter would be silicone and silicone typically is found in defoamers or anti-foaming agents and you can see that none of the membrane types like to have silicone a whole heck of a lot. So um, if deformers are in your plants, and I'm not talking um, 
CIP defoamers like Defoamer 553, those are based on surfactants. I'm talking more food processing defoamers for product that are, could be silicone based. Very, very important to keep those away from membranes because if you get a silicone film uh, from a defoamer on a membrane, uh, it's very difficult, if not impossible, to remove and can cause you major headaches. And then, of course, the other things on there are mainly dissolved minerals that can come from water. Um, Cow water, uh, polished cow water, for, or I should say RO permeate from a processed water from the plant from like maybe uh, lactose concentration. That should usually generally be very good in minerals and not have a lot of contaminants where you have to worry about more uh, in, in those types of waters is the, is the bacteria loading. So they either need to UV or chemically treat their water with a biocide and be careful. If you're using chlorine to treat your cow water, at the facility that you service, what does that do if you're going to use that water to clean ROs or nanos? That can be a problem. You may have to dechlorinate the water. So keep that in mind. All right. So as I said before, remember I said I was going to go over this twice, so I said it already. So I, I just want to do it one more time. Every account manager with membranes in their territory um, should know that equation that I talked about to calculate their hydraulics of their system and look at it at least periodically because if the hydraulics are good and the chemistry is good, um, chances are that unless there's a mechanical failure of a valve or a pump, your system should run pretty error free for a long period of time unless something funny happens. But the two most the two most common things that happen that cause problems in membranes, um, it could be uh, something happens where the hydraulics get out of whack. It could be a sensor that fails or a pump that's running wrong, okay? Or it could be uh, somebody misusing chemicals. So if we can control those two things, um, we unfortunately don't have control over the product that they run, but the hydraulics are, are most important. How many times have somebody, has you an account manager gone into a plant and somebody says to you, yeah, your chemicals aren't working. You know, don't you love hearing that? And when you come to do an investigation, you find out that something mechanical is wrong with their system and it has to do with hydraulics. That would probably be nine times out of 10 that that's the case. So again, just to recap, you wanna calculate that pressure drop in your stages or your loops, depending on who made the system, they call it a stage or a loop. You take your um, loop pressure minus the baseline pressure and you divide that by the number of membranes in each housing and you should get a number between 10 and 15. It may be a little lower than that if it's an RO or nano, or it may be a little higher than that if it's a, a larger spacer size UF. But if you get somewhere in that 10 to 15 range, generally speaking, as a rule of thumb, um, your hydraulics in that stage are working probably like they should. So what is the what does the proper flow do? Well, first of all, why do we use that calculation? If Felicity and Carl had said that, in one of their previous sessions. And the reason being is that, you know, we could put a $3,000 plus dollar flow meter on each loop pump of a system, but that would greatly increase the cost of a system. So we can, we can determine if we have proper flow by doing that equation. And that's why we use the pressure drop instead of a flow meter, because it was simply a cost savings mess, uh, uh, measure when they were designing the system. But during CIP, Okay, here's the, here's the important distinction I want to make when you calculate this delta P. If you calculate it during CIP, what you generally might find is that you'll have a lower baseline pressure than as you would during production. But you'll also have higher cross flow. You'll have higher, uh, the, the, the loop pumps may be running at a faster uh, hertz or speed. Because the key to cleaning a membrane is you want to have the flow as high as safely possible but the lowest transmembrane pressure or the lowest baseline pressure because we don't want to force whatever soil that we lift off the membranes, we don't want to force it back onto the surface. So you want to have high cross flow and relatively low, low baseline pressure. And how low a baseline pressure do we want? Well, that's, I'm, I'm not a, you know, an expert to say exactly what you want, but you want, you want some positive baseline pressure in your baseline because if your baseline pressure drops to zero, that means you're starving one or more of your loop pumps. So you want to have positive baseline pressure. I would say at least at least around 10 PSI is what you want to be looking at um, generally. Um, it might be a little bit lower for a, a, a NMF unit, but generally you want to have positive baseline pressure throughout your baseline to make sure that you're not starving any of your loop pumps. That brings us to the different types of soils or followants. And uh, this is mainly what our chemistry is going to be concerned with. And when you're processing dairy products, because that's mainly what we do, we do probably a little bit of wine, a little bit of blood, some other things, but mainly 
you can break your soils down into the four basic categories. You have fats, oils, and greases, or fog. We'll just call them fats. You can get proteins, sugars, and mineral, okay? The first three soils are organic soils, and they're acidic in nature. You react those with caustics to help remove them. And then the final soil, mineral, is alkaline in nature. You need an acid to remove that, okay? Those are the common food soils. That's what our chemistry does, and we remove stuff like that all day. However, there are other sources of soil that can be that can be uh, can pose major problems for us. Particulate soils. If you have a, a pump that's wearing out, it's grinding metal and putting metal particles into your system. Okay, that's not a good thing. If you have a water supply or a well that it could suck up clay or silica or sand, and you get insoluble particles on your membranes. Well, the membranes are going to do just that. The first membranes in the train are going to catch catch that contamination, usually in the first loop that you're running. Silica. Silica can come from your water supply or it can come from things like defoamers. A lot of times defoamers will have hydrophobic silica that'll be homogenized into them and that's what breaks the bubbles. Well, that silica is like sand that can also deposit on your membranes. And we all know <clears throat> removing silica requires something like hydrofluoric acid. And it, unfortunately, the cure to get silica out of the membranes would also probably trash your membranes. So once it's in there, it's not coming out. The only course is to change membranes. Defoamers, not only is the silica portion of, of defoamers prob problematic, also a lot of defoamers are made out of insoluble substances like oils, modified vegetable oils or other, other things that can become a problem, a problem to remove effectively from membranes. You generally have to use some pretty aggressive cleaning um, uh, practices and a lot of surfactant and solvents to try to remove deformer residue from membranes. And then of course the big one, uh, microbiological growth. And how do we control that? By routine sanitizing of our membranes. And we'll talk about sanitizing. We have a whole section on sanitizers in our chemistry section. But um, you know, I've seen a lot of customers that uh, get in, in a time pinch and they'll stop and they'll skip the sanitize. That can be very, very dangerous. And the problem with sanitizing, uh, skipping and sanitizing is this the microbes can actually get onto the permeate side of the membrane. That's the low pressure, low flow side of the membranes. And if it gets in there, it's nearly impossible to get out. So it's very important to monitor CIP logs to make sure that the customer is sanitizing their membranes on a periodic or regular basis. There's a number of different methods to how chemicals work to help to, uh, remove the soil from membranes. The most common is dissolving. It's like if you take granular sugar and put it in hot water, it dissolves. The water surrounds it, it dissolves and becomes a clear miscible liquid, okay? That's how a lot of the soil is removed from membranes, but not all not all soils are dissolvable or, or will, will readily dissolve in the water in your cleaning solution. So we have to sometimes use what are called chelating agents, chelating agents that will actually dissolve mineral soils that are not soluble at pH 2 that you need much more acidity to dissolve them. We can also oxidize the soils through hypochlorite or through um, peroxide in which we would break up a protein into amino acids by oxidizing that protein. We have enzyme hydrolysis for membranes that can't tolerate oxidizers, but we have protein soils. We can use enzymes to break those uh, those proteins down into their uh, into their um, building block amino acids. <clears throat> and then emulsification, which is a very, very common way to remove fat soils and greases by using surfactants. And we'll talk about that. That'll be, uh, <clears throat> Mark will shine on that and I'm sure he'll tell you all there is to know about surfactants coming up very shortly here. <clears throat> there are other ways that we remove soil that we might be familiar with. When you're cleaning an evaporator or a pasteurizer and maybe a cream press, we use 175 degrees and maybe one to two percent caustic and under those conditions we turn fat into soap it's called saponification but we can't really use that to clean membranes unless you want to change the membranes out right after that wash because membranes can't tolerate that high of a temperature for the most part or that high of a ph that would require to turn fat to soap so we have to use another means to do that and like i said membranes can't tolerate very high temperatures or strong oxidizers Generally, um, membranes will have <clears throat> certain membranes will have limited. Um, they can tolerate limited exposure to oxidizers, and those would be MFs and UFs. Okay, that's why. What do we do when we're doing a chlorinated alkaline wash on an MF or UF unit? We try to maintain our chlorine on the final wash between 150 and 180 ppm, and never go above 200 ppm. Okay, above 200 ppm, you can start oxidizing the surface of that membrane, opening up those pores, and causing what you. Uh, passage of molecules that you don't want to pass through that membrane. 
Likewise, another way to clean protein off of evaporators would be to, be used, to use very hot acid or very hot ca caustic products at high concentrations. You have acid or alkaline hydrolysis. Of course, in order to hyd hydrolyze something in an acidic or alkaline environment, you need pHs very uh, way lower than the acceptable range or, or much, very much over the acceptable range for cleaning membranes. And then heavy solvents. <clears throat> solvents <clears throat> can be a problem because membranes are held together by what? You remember seeing the How It's Made video that I think Carl showed? There's a lot of glue and, and polymers used in membranes. And if you have heavy solvents, you have potential of softening that glue and, and um, uh, ruining the membranes as well. So anyway, with that being said, I would like to talk a little bit about the different types of chemical categories, just to mention them briefly, of the things that we have in our arsenal to clean membranes, acids, alkaline cleaners, surfactants, oxidizers, enzymes, keelants, solvents, sanitizers, and soaps and preservatives. We have so many chemicals because, as, as you might be aware from your sanitation class, uh, if you remember, soils are not generally pure. They consist of a mixture of different things. You'll have organic soils that could be proteins and fats, intermingled with minerals. So it usually requires a multi-step cleaning process and multiple cleaners to have an effective uh, cleaning program to get the membranes 100% clean and return to, um, to make them ready for operation. Acid cleaning, okay? Um, when you have minerals in your system, the best thing to do is to use an acid to clean those out. It's the most uh, economical and the most efficient. When we're dealing with milk or dairy soils, we're generally dealing with calcium phosphate, potentially calcium carbonate. Both of those mineral types or those mineral salts are very, very easily solubilized by acid. Okay, and the acids that we use could be either phosphonitric blends like Bright Salt 167 or Reflux 193, or they could more than likely could be their plant acid, the bulk acid that the, that the customer is using. Uh, examples being MPA number 168, which is a phosphonitric blend as well, but it's more of a, a general CIP acid. Or nitric-based products, Image 186, Nitro Plus, Ultra LFA. Um, <clears throat> we have found that we can use those acids um, pretty much on almost all types of membranes. They are being used, but you have to be careful. And I'll talk about that on the next slide. But Acid clean is the most important generally in RO and NF membranes because they tend to just do sh straight concentration of products and they have the most potential for mineral to build up. It's not uncommon for UF and MF membranes to not have to acid wash every day. They still have to acid wash, but generally not as often as an RO or an NF does. As I talked about, calcium phosphate is your most common precipitate and is very easily removed and it reacts very quickly with acid at temperature, okay? Um, but there are many acid products that we can use to clean membranes, but keep in mind that nanomembranes, generally the, the manufacturers of nanomembranes do not allow the use of strong nitric acid solutions to clean the nanos. And the reason being is that the surface of a nano filtration membrane is very susceptible to being oxidized. Just like we don't want to use chlorine on ROs or nanos, strong nitric acid solutions can become, an, uh, nitric acid is an, is an oxidizing acid. And above certain concentrations, and don't quote me on this, but I think it's like 67 grams per liter, um, it will basically become an oxidizer and can destroy uh, membranes. Um, or it can make them brittle and cause premature failure, okay? So in any acid cleaning, there's a couple of rules of thumb that I wanna note here, and this is very, very important. Number one, slow controlled addition is critical. If your system calls for five gallons of acid, the last thing we wanna do is see an operator take a five gallon container and dump the whole thing uh, straight into the feed balance tank. You wanna have a slow controlled addition to avoid those those huge pH swings that could happen until the until the chemical gets dispersed in the system. That also is uh, applies to adding caustic or alkaline chemicals as well. We want to avoid those high pH swings in order to, to um, maximize our potential membrane life. The other thing with acid washing, a lot of systems, especially those pra uh, processing lactose permeate, can get a large mineral buildup in them and they can consume a lot of acid, okay? And so you might hit your target pH on your first pH check, but then come back halfway through and you're already up to pH 2.8 to 3.5. I'm just throwing that range out there. And so what's the first, the first thing to do is the operator says, oh, I got to add more acid to get my pH down to two. 
Well, there comes a point in time when, you, when an acid solution can only dissolve so much mineral scale. And as it dissolves calcium scale, it forms a buffer solution. And uh, to be, keep this really simple, buffer solutions resist pH changes, number one. Number two, you only have effective uh, mineral scale removal from any type of membrane system if your pH is around two. Okay, if you start getting up above two and a half, you stop dissolving mineral on a, on a, in an efficient manner. If the operator then would go add fresh acid to the system. If there's enough dissolved mineral in that CIP solution, you'll never get that pH down back to two. So the rule of thumb that I like to go by that I use is if it takes more acid to get your pH into the desired range, then you add it on the initial dose, you should dump that wash solution and do an, an additional acid wash. That's what I found that if you have to add more acid than your initial dose to maintain your pH throughout the wash, you should dump that wash and, and perform another acid wash because you basically saturated your, your CIP solution and it won't dissolve any more mineral. So acid cleaning transitions into alkaline cleaning, okay? So alkaline clean, why do we, we, we use acids to remove minerals? Alkaline cleaners would be used to neutralize acidic soils. So what are acidic soils, organic soils? Proteins. Proteins are made up of amino acids, okay? Fats. Fats are made up, or another name for fats is lipids. Their building block is fatty acids, okay? So these oils are, I mean, these soils, not oils, these soils are um, acidic in nature. And how do you neutralize an acidic soil? You neutralize it with a caustic or an alkaline cleaner, okay? So you want to neutralize them to make them soluble to get them out of the way, okay? So there's a lot to alkaline cleaning, and generally alkaline cleaner, cleaners we don't use by themselves. We will add added additives to them to help enhance their effectiveness, okay? So the alkaline, the alkalinity exists to neutralize the acidity of the soil, but there's other things we add to alkaline cleaners to help and assist them to be more effective at cleaning these soils. Um, so generally, what do we add to our alkaline wash? Let's say we're adding, we use Rely 391, or we're using Ultra 1030, or we're using some alkaline source. We'll generally add to an alkaline wash, you can add surfactant. You can add chlorine or oxidizers to help aid in protein removal on UF and MF membranes, okay? Um, peroxide can be used too, but generally chlorine is the most common, all right? Uh, and if you can't, if your membranes can't tolerize, tolerate oxidizers, well, what else would you add to an alkaline wash? You could add enzymes, all right? So all of those things can be uh, added or additives to alkaline cleaners to help them perform better. Um, and like I said at the bottom, alkaline cleaners should only be paired with oxidizers if the membranes are compatible. So now I'm going to go into a my basic, uh, my diatribe that I like to give about commodity versus built membrane cleaners. Um, you'll notice in here, when I'll have a slide at the end that'll list all of our membrane cleaners. There's two different schools of thought. <clears throat> what is what is one thing that that uh, Hydrite always gets pressure to do? You're as an account manager, you're always pressured to cut costs out of a system, right? And uh, granted, that's we don't want to be speeding. We want to be competitive. With, you know, we want to have a competitive pricing so we can't get you know ousted from the business by somebody else that'll come in and do stuff better and cheaper. But um, I did want to make a note. What is the difference between a commodity caustic and a built caustic? Okay, so this is really simple. I'll try to keep this real simple. A commodity caustic would be something as simple as sodium hydroxide or potassium hydroxide. Okay, nothing else in it. Maybe a or maybe a touch of glucan gluconic acid as a chelator to help with iron staining when you clean an evaporator or separator. Okay, when you put a commodity caustic that's non-built caustic into water. 100% of it ionizes into OH negative ions and into the other sodium or potassium ion, okay? So pH is a measurement of, uh, I'll just kind of simplify this. It's a measurement of the amount of either H plus ions or OH negative ions in solution. If you have more OH negative ions than H plus, you have an alkaline solution, your pH is above seven. If you have more H plus ions than you have OH negative ions, as if you add an acid to water, it releases H plus, your pH goes down, okay, and, and that's what happens. So that's what happens when you put chemicals into water. So with a commodity caustic, such as sodium hydroxide, when you put a little bit of that in water, 100% of it ionizes, and it releases a lot of OH negative into the solution. So what does that do? What does that mean for us? That means a very small amount of caustic added to water will raise the pH really high really quickly. 
So you can only add a relatively small amount of caustic to a membrane cleaning solution before you hit your pH limitation. Okay, so it'd be instant. For instance, if you like having a five gallon pail of water and putting a thimble full of caustic in it, you take a pH measurement of that five gallon pail, that thimble full of caustic, you could be at pH 12 to 14. Okay, it's really high up there. How much cleaning capacity does that solution have with that little bit of caustic? As soon as that little bit of caustic sees a little bit of soil, it'll effectively neutralize that caustic you put in. So what does that mean when you're cleaning your membranes? It means you'll have your pH where you need it on your initial concentration check, but you come back five minutes later and check your pH, and instead of being between 10.8 and 11, it's going to be down to like 10 or 9.8. So what does it mean? Can you clean a membrane system successfully with commodity caustics? The answer is yes, but it requires a very diligent operator taking numerous pH checks and making numerous small or incremental additions of caustic to maintain the desired pH or the IE, the clean capacity of the solution. Okay, so I've known very diligent customers that have a highly trained staff <clears throat> that have used stuff like 50% caustic or accumulated caustic MG and they've been successful at cleaning membranes. But, it, but as soon as you get a new operator in that doesn't know how to maintain or if they get busy doing other things, you can compromise your cleaning. So the difference between a commodity caustic and a built caustic. A built caustic generally contains the commodity caustic as one of its ingredients, but a portion of that caustic has been neutralized by an acidic component put into that chemistry. For instance, our built products are made of potassium carbonate, is one of the builders that's in them. So we take potassium hydroxide, neutralize it with CO2, okay? So that partially neutralized caustic doesn't cause the pH to go up quite as rapidly as a commodity caustic because it stays kind of as a potassium carbonate. Another, another builder would be potass uh, sodium gluconate. If you have a caustic cleaner and you add a bunch of gluconic acid to it, you partially neutralize the caustic and make sodium gluconate. Those products or those built products, uh, you can add a lot more of them to solution before you exceed pH 11 or 11.2, whatever your upper pH limit is. So they have a lot more alkalinity and alkalinity is a measure of the soil absorbing capacity. You can get a lot more alkalinity and not exceed your pH. So what does that mean? That means once you hit your pH target using a built product, okay, um, that product, because you put so much more chemical in in order to get up to pH 11, it has a lot more cleaning and soil absorbing capacity. So chances are, once you hit your pH, you go to do your your your, your mid pH check, your pH won't drop. Or it'll drop very slightly, and you'll maintain the desired pH, i.e., cleaning capacity or alkalinity, throughout your entire cleaning process. So it, you can, it's a more forgiving system. So the operator doesn't have to be there and check. Is as often and they can be assured once they hit their target pH, they're going to have the right cleaning uh, chemistry and capacity to carry themselves through to the end of the wash. That brings us to the products that we typically use. Um, I listed commodity caustics. We don't rec we don't generally recommend those to customers right out of the gate because of those issues, because you need a you know very highly trained staff and, and there's just a potential for a lot of things to go wrong and they can be overused. Not only can you your pH fall because you don't put enough in, Operators, when you use commodity products because they know that pH is going to fall, this never happens, right? But they don't add a little extra up front and get their pH up to 11.5, 11.7, knowing that in their in their mid wash, they're going to come back and it'll be in line so they can, don't have to pause the system and make an adjustment. They can let it run through. So generally, if you use commodity caustics, two things can happen. You get compromised cleaning because the operator doesn't keep adding the required amount to keep the pH where it needs to be, or they'll add too much up front maybe maybe not report it and then when they take their fight their second check it'll be fine so your membranes get exposed to higher phs than they should have and remember the ph is a logarithmic scale a ph of 11 is 10 times stronger than a ph of 10 and likewise a ph of 11.5 is five times i think something stronger than a ph of 11. i, I might be screwing that up but what i'm saying is it's not a one-to-one -one. what we recommend is we recommend a different built cleaners and now I, i've listed the rest of hydrates cleaners in somewhat in, in order of their level of builders. So we have Hydroflux NP366. Most of you have probably heard of this. This is probably one of our wide, most widely used uh, chemistries. Um, it's not very well built, but it's got some, uh, some healants in it, some soil dispersing agents and a small amount of surfactant. And it's probably one of our most uh, 
you know, pound for dollar per pound, pound per pound, um, most effective products as far as an economical product and being effective. It works, it works well, but you still may have to do some pH adjustment with that because it doesn't have a lot of buffering capacity. Uh, similar to that, we have Hydroflux 380. And I should mention Hydroflux 380 with the first chemical on the next page, which is Rely number 391. Those are both buffered caustics. Um, the only difference between Hydroflux 380 or the major difference between Hydroflux 380 and Rely 391 is that Hydroflux 380 doesn't have any EDTA. Rely number 391 does. Why would we not have any EDTA? Mm -hmm. Certain customers uh, for discharge requirements, um, especially in industries other than dairy, don't like EDTA. EDTA, as you will learn, is a, is a strong chelator. It can tie up metal ions, and some people have metal dis, metal ion discharge restrictions in their wastewater, and that uh, and the EDTA causes a problem that it binds so tightly with the metal it doesn't release it, and they end up being over their discharge limits for certain metals. That's the long and the short of it. So Hydroflux 380 is one that we don't use a whole lot, but it's in our system. Just we want you to be aware of it. On the next slide here, of course, I said Rely, Rely number 391. That is a set of good buffered caustic. It contains both potassium and, and sodium hydroxide, and it also has keelants. Further down the list is Alkabuild 393. That is a more highly buffered caustic. It's based on potassium hydroxide only, no sodium, um, no sodium caustic in it, I should say, but it has keelants and, and it also contains alkaline phosphates, which are also very good at emulsifying and dispersing soils as well. So Alkabuild is getting in, into more of a premium product area and it would be used more where people have potentially bad water or water that needs to have something that the um, that needs to be tied up because the water isn't isn't as good as it should be like a cow water. Okay, so if you have well water that could have some contaminants in it, we need to go keep going down this list and getting better and better. And that brings us to our most highly buffered product, HMC number 330. And that's a strongly buffered caustic. It's generally buffered with gluconate. Um, and it also has anionic surfactant and a strong keelant package in it. It's a premium product. And I've used this product in areas where, um, I, I know some dairies are using it, but I used it in a wastewater application where we had a lot of insoluble salts like uh, uh, calcium oxalates and other things where we used the chelation of this product to help remove um, mineral soils that weren't soluble at pH two. And with that being said, take it away, Mark. The alkaline cleaners usually pair really well with our surfactants. Um, surfactant is essentially a detergent, and uh, those are, uh, they've got a certain structure that allows them to handle a chemical process called emulsification. So not everything suspends well or dissolves well in water, and uh, these surfactants help those types of molecules that don't generally suspend well in water to do so. Uh, beyond just cleaning, they also uh, have a uh, capability called wetting, which essentially means that they uh, minimize the resistance between uh, repelling molecules. So uh, for both the soil collection and uh, dissolving as well as simply the membrane function uh, there's an increase in the efficacy and efficiency of doing so uh, when utilizing surfactants correctly. So primarily for food, we're using them for fat removal. So fat is hydrophobic, doesn't like water, doesn't dissolve well, and uh, these are going to be vital to enhancing and allowing that to occur. Um, they're also utilized for some protein removal. A lot of our products that utilize uh, like whey proteins or milk or uh, any type of dairy or egg product, um, they're going to benefit from utilizing a surfactant uh, because some proteins themselves are not necessarily very hydrophilic or they don't dissolve well. And um, again, their mechanism is going to be emulsification and it's going to emulsify those hydrophobic soils, but it's also going to be useful in removing essentially all soils because of that wetting effect. So here's kind of a illustration of what the surfactant molecules look like. So on the left side, uh, you're gonna see what are the ionic surfactant types, uh, specifically anionic types uh, are what I've drawn here. And then on the right, you've got what are the non-ionic types. So this is gonna be your NPE and your hydroclins. 
Um, but as you can see, they've got similar structures to the extent where the bottom halves are all uh, in black, which is representative of uh, carbon chains or carbon structures which are hydrophobic. And the top half has aspects which are uh, also um, hydro hydrophilic. So they're going to react and, and bind well with water. So you've got your surfactant molecule and it's going to go ahead and, and prefer to lay out on the surface of um, whatever your system is, whether it's a glass of water or if it's a membrane uh, system. Um, and all of those hydrophobic tails are gonna find uh, residence on a surface which is farthest away from water. So if you think about those tails essentially trying to run away, they're gonna kind of line the surfaces of your system, especially the membranes, which are hydrophobic. Um, they're gonna be a polymer themselves. They're gonna have a slight charge, but for the most part, they're gonna be uh, treated and they're gonna be kind of a non-polar aspect of your system. Um, the soil is also going to have uh, its itself lined, especially if it's a hydrophobic soil. And so it's going to find itself surrounded by uh, surfactants from the tail end. And then as you can see, all of the red parts here uh, representative of the charged end of the particle uh, or the uh, the area that's able to hydrogen bond with the water is going to be facing and attracted to the water or the aqueous portion of your system. So then you're gonna end up having these additional surfactant molecules that you've run out of space on the edges of your system. And this is why it's incredibly important to dose surfactants properly, is you want to achieve a threshold that is above this critical myocell concentration is what it's called. So once you line every aspect of the surface, uh, all of the surfaces of the liquid, um, you're going to have all these extra surfactants floating around in solution, and they're gonna essentially not put their heads together, but put their tails together to try to run away from that water. Uh, and that's gonna produce um, the property of, of water that we most commonly desert, uh, observe when we add surfactant and we see bubbles. Um, it, that's the level above which you want to have a surfactant in order for it to function properly. Now, why is this gonna help it function properly? And that comes to the fact that all of those tails are competing to get away from the water. Uh, and they're gonna reside in these myocells as a sort of last ditch resort, but they would prefer to have their own hydrophobic surface to contact. And so what's going to occur uh, is the, the kinetics of the system are gonna cause those surfactant tails to start embedding and kind of looking for more space on any type of molecule which can be broken up. So um, molecules that have a lot of intermolecular forces, but not a lot of in intramolecular forces. So they're, they're basically clumps of stuff that are stuck together, but they're not actually uh, strongly bound together. So the surfactant's not gonna tear apart molecules, but if there's multiple molecules in one place, they're gonna start kind of uh, trying to find ways to get in and surface around them. So then at that point, uh, it's gonna kind of break it free and create that additional surface area. And then some of these myocells are gonna be able to uh, break apart. Um, because even though it's it's somewhat optimal under the critical myocell concentration, those heads don't wanna be close together. So they're gonna be constantly competing to try to tear apart those myocells. It's kind of a dynamic tension. And the way that it's resolved is by degrading soils and creating that additional surface area. So then at that certain point, you're gonna end up having uh, a, my, the micelles surrounding and, and taking the soil away. And this is gonna be especially like your oils um, and other small particles. Uh, so then the other aspect of surfactants is not just the cleaning. Um, and this is gonna describe both the cleaning aspect and then just the functionality aspect of it, but um, kind of an explanation of wetting. If you have a water molecule on a surface, especially a hydrophobic surface like the, uh, the membrane, at the atomic level, there's actually a space in between the water molecule and the, the membrane surface. And this is, um, you can describe this in a lot of different ways. If you're, you're familiar with the, the zeta potential mo uh, model or um, other types of descriptions, you have aspects of both of them that have positive and negative charges. 
Uh, and kind of what is, is happening is once you get close enough, you're going to have those positive charges repelling each other as much as the negative charges on the end pulling them in. So what the surfactant's uh, going to do is it's essentially going to help uh, to sort of um, work like a puzzle piece and counteract those, those charges so that it can draw the water in closer. So normally water is extremely attracted to itself. Um, it's kind of, uh, it's if you've ever seen like a, a meniscus, so if you've held a glass of water, especially in like a plastic glass, you'll see that it's not an, actually a flat surface, but it sort of domes up. And what that is, is that the water is less interested in the container it's in as it's interested in itself. So it'll kind of stick together and that's that surface tension. So by putting surfactants in, that breaks down that surface tension and it makes it so that the water can relate to the edges uh, of the system or the soil or the membrane surface just as much as it can associate well with itself. <clears throat> so by uh, putting the surfactants in the system, you end up with that wetting effect. And if you can think about this concept in relation to like the actual pores on the membrane, by making it so the water can essentially get closer to the edge of those pores, you actually increase the uh, the amount of water that can go through there. So you effectively, the, the diameter of those pores is increased. Um, even though it hasn't changed size, there's just more water because it can get closer to the edges. And so when we wash a system and we utilize surfactants, we're actually uh, finding a, there, there's actually a benefit to the fact that some of it sticks around as residual because it's not just a matter of cleaning, um, it's also a matter of if you've ever uh, heard of membranes going hydrophobic or put new membranes in, you want a wash where there's actually gonna be a wetting effect where you're gonna get enough surfactant on the surface that it increases um, its flux. And this is the mechanism of how it sort of does that. Is it, is it, uh, it increases the affinity of the membrane surface and the pores for the liquid that's traveling or trying to travel through them. There's types of surfactants. I mentioned briefly uh, uh, the anionic type and the non-ionic type. And so these are the types that we're going to use on membranes. Um, your anionic types most consistently are going to be depth build, and we have that built into a lot of other products, not just its open individual sourced uh, surfactant. Um, and your non-ionic types are going to be like hydroclens, and they have better wetting, better fat removal, um, and they generally are used strongly on UF and MFs, and that's because they also have recently um, been shown to, uh, if you use them on ROs or NFs, there's some of them that have poor compatibility, uh, and you can actually end up causing problems with those types of membranes. So generally, um, all membranes can use the anionic type, and we usually restrict the non-ionic types to uh, the UF and the MF systems. Again, this is just a reiteration of that and kind of a more of a larger breakdown of what the product types are. Uh, we've For the non-ionic, um, the most common is gonna be your bright cleanse and that's your NPE based surfactant. And we'll talk a little bit in the next slide about NPE and why there's a push to go away from it. Um, and our alternative is the HydroCleanse 325. And the difference is, is uh, you've got the surfactant molecules um, are, are, are similar in the hydro portion, but the hydrophobic portion uh, has a slight difference between, um, it's, it's got a more, a greater similarity to just like a regular detergent molecule. Uh, and so it degrades easier and it's less of an environmental concern. concern. The anionic, uh, so anionic, it means it's a, you know, a negatively charged molecule. Again, another reason why these work really well in your uh, alkaline solutions is you actually have the better dissociation. Um, and you end up with the free anion, which has better reactivity and interaction with the water um, for solubility purposes. Uh, but your non-ionics, uh, you've got a couple of different options. So if you, your customer can go NPE, um, great value, great efficacy with just the bright cleanse. There's the bright flux, which is an interesting uh, similar type of product, except it, it combines some solvents. So it, it's using a water soluble kind of glycol ether, which helps it to have extremely effective fat removal um, and creating sort of a system of surfactant emulsification. NPE just means nonylphenol ethoxylate. So nonylphenol is gonna be the component that is a, a hydrophobic portion on that. And if you saw earlier in the slide, that was the one on the far right that kind of looked like it had 
couple of different hexagonal shapes. Um, and why that's a problem is because that's actually uh, very similar to an estradiol molecule, so an estrogen in human terms. Um, but throughout the ecosystem, there's a lot of uh, you know similarities where that's actually kind of it's a, an endocrine disruptor. So it's going to cause uh, certain things to develop improperly, especially in aquatic life. And there's been enough seen on it that it's definitely um, a big no-no in infant formula because you know humans under development very susceptible to changes in, um, in in kind of the the xeno hormone area of their environment and because of that um, we're we've developed other products as replacements um, so NP highly effective extremely efficient as a surfactant molecule uh, but it's really hard for the, it to break down environmentally and uh, the the sort of residual molecule that sits around for a while is uh, potentially harmful. Um, so that's where we bring in our our non-ionic NPE surfactants, our hydroclins, and we also have our winter blend now, which is a slight variation that uh, again uh, has minimal uh, gelling under colder conditions. Um, and the NPE free surfactants uh, that are that are the non-ionic type. So there are other types of surfactants, uh, cationic types, most commonly you'll know these as quats, and amphoteric surfactants. Uh, these do not ever touch membranes or they will destroy them. Um, the amphoteric, there are certain areas where they can be used and I've seen them used even on membranes, but if you misjudge the pH, and drop them out of solution, um, they're going to become uh, kind of an irreversible uh, foulant as well. So in general, just to make sure that if the customer has these in the plant, that they never come anywhere near the membranes. Um, and this just sort of harps on the general guideline that not don't use any chemicals other than those specified in the cleaning procedure. Um, if you need a new procedure based on chemicals that have changed, especially you know plant acids or um, other commodity chemistry, that's something that we absolutely would, would love to help make sure that that gets implemented instead of there being uh, the wrong procedure listed and people just assuming that one chemical is you know, a replacement for one that's on the procedure sheet. So oxidizers are the next category of chemicals and this is what we're going to utilize to attack uh, primarily protein. Um, so there is uh, you know, the most common kind, Santa King, so they are, are what we commonly refer to as simply chlorine, uh, but also peroxides and uh, chlorine dioxide. Um, and they're going to effectively break chemical bonds. However, uh, we got to control them because some of the chemical bonds that they're going to have a preference for are the chemical bonds that actually hold the membrane polymer together. Um, parasitic acid is actually also a sanitizer and we'll get into but it's an oxidizer but we'll get into that in the sanitizers um, and essentially the note for this is that even though they can be used on all membrane types there's very limited exposure time in order to avoid uh, causing too much oxidation of the membrane surface so the alternative to oxidizers which has fewer of the negative attributes that oxidizers are are enzymes so an oxidizer is going to work essentially as a scattershot uh, mechanism to uh, break up a molecule. So the, the example I like to use is it's like trying to get into a house with a shotgun versus a key. Um, an oxidizer will eventually get you in there, but there's going to be collateral damage and it's going to basically you're going to use up your the mechanism that you're trying to get in there with. Um, so with the soil, you are going to break it up. You're not going to specifically target the amino bonds that are holding those proteins together. And in the end, you're going to go ahead and uh, you're going to end up risking the membranes. Whereas uh, enzymes, it's like literally like a key. Um, it only fits in the correct location and it uses a very effective economy of energy to accomplish what you're trying to do. So enzymes are derived from living organisms. Uh, it's the mechanism that pretty much all life utilizes in order to accomplish all of the metabolic chemical reactions taking place. Um, so a lot of these are actually harvested from grown up uh, microorganisms. Uh, so 
a lot of bacteria or uh, I think that's where the majority of our, our industrial enzymes come from. Um, so they're going to break down only at the specific required point in the soil. Um, again, I refer to protein a lot because that's where the large amount of our enzymes are focused. Uh, there are ones that, you know, break down starch or fat into utilizing those on a case-by-case -case basis, but especially in the food area, uh, primarily proteases are, are going to be our um, where our product line is focused. So even though the enzymes don't exhaust themselves, uh, so in a normal chemical reaction, uh, say for example an oxidizer, the oxidizer is going to be reduced and the target molecule is going to be oxidized and then that's exhausted and that's where you're having to titrate and bring your chlorine back up into the optimal range. With an enzyme, that's not the case. Uh, the enzyme is going to go ahead and just keep working until the soil is gone. And that's how and why um, their kinetics, uh, they kind of are self-adjusting to how dirty a system is. Um, so you can kind of time them a little bit easier uh, to be more consistent in how long it takes to conduct a certain wash. Um, but what's most important for an effective enzyme wash is that it maintains the optimal temperature and pH ranges. So the, as a biological molecule, they're um, you know, sort of evolved to, to work in the best environmental conditions of the microbe. And so mimicking those conditions inside of your system uh, and sort of making sure that you know, if your temperature doesn't stretch beyond what that enzyme is supposed to work at, uh, or your pH is in the correct range, is going to make sure that you have the most effective wash. So here's an example of what enzymes, uh, how they break apart molecules as opposed to like an oxidation reaction. Um, the substrate, or in the, our case, soil, is going to come into contact with it, and the enzyme is essentially going to compromise uh, its stability of the bonds holding it together. So going back to you know your high school physics uh, lectures or whatever, you have this term called entropy, and pretty much everything in the universe is moving towards the state of disorder. But in in the case of molecules, it's sort of disrupted by these bonds holding things together, and the enzyme basically comes into that bond, puts it in that compromised position, and then the molecule just says, "Well, I'd rather be in a disordered state," and it breaks apart. So it preserves the enzyme so it can go and do this to a lot more soil molecules and continue breaking them up uh, there and, and it does so with an efficiency of energy. We do have ways to test the efficacy of the enzyme in cleaning solution. A lot of you might be familiar with the standard film test. So film uh, is you know standard film. It's different oxidized uh, silver molecules that are embedded in a gelatin matrix on the surface of a plastic. And so if you dip it into solution uh, with enzyme in it, gelatin being a protein is degraded and the ink kind of comes off into the solution. You end up with the clear film base like you see on the left. Um, on the right is an example of a, a test that we've been kind of improving. It's been under development and should have hopefully some newer and more valuable iterations in the near future. But as you can see, even though the film test is not complete yet, um, the, the visible indicator test, it tells you if you got active enzyme pretty much right away. This is kind of a, an example of it. Um, I don't know if you guys have the audio, but this is just the negative uh, control with no reaction to the visible enzyme indicator. And then this is an active enzyme solution, wash solution, a little bit of the reagent in it. As you can see, it very rapidly changes color. The next category of cleaners we're going to talk about is chelators. Uh, chelators, as Glenn foreshadowed, can sometimes be really necessary if the mineral scale you're trying to dissolve does not dissolve above uh, pH 2. So if you remember to that slide, kind of about trying to hit that sweet spot in between what the membranes can tolerate and what's effective for cleaning. Uh, if that uh, sweet spot really just doesn't even exist, we can go the other direction for inorganics. Um, so I'm going to go a little bit into the mechanism in the next slide. Uh, some of the tools in our kit, the D scale or uh, sort of the built product, the HMC 330, uh, can be utilized to this end. 
Um, but what's really important uh, is making sure that they're timed effectively. So putting them in solution when they're not going to counteract other chemistry. I know this comes into play when you're using uh, an oxidizer, uh, and there's some evidence that it could be coming into play when we're using enzymes that the uh, keylent is either going to sequester all the min minerals and compromise uh, the enzyme, or uh, it's going to react with the oxidizer. And basically the oxidizer, such as your chlorine, is going to attack the keylent instead of the soil, and you're gonna end up with that big drop in chlorine. Um, and also, essentially, because your keylent is being dis disabled, uh, you're going to end up with less calcium sequestered in solution. So calcium being the big one uh, that we generally target, there's a couple of options. Um, you got your EDTA, which is the most common, and that's going to be our D-scale standalone product, but that's built into a lot of others, including... Uh, and we also build in polyacrylate and gluconate to others. Uh, Chelators offer uh, a quality called denticity, which simply means that they have multiple points with similar charge. Uh, and what this allows for is uh, if you have a positively charged cation, such as a calcium molecule, uh, not only is your chelator going to go ahead and grab onto it and essentially have that claw effect. Chelator actually means claw, or chelate means claw in Greek. Um, but it's if, if one of those bonds sort of dissociates over time, the calcium is still going to be bound by other potential bonds and it's going to be competed with on the same molecule. And this results in a really highly stable complex. One note I'd like to make, Mark, about chelators and as far as gluconate goes. Yeah. Uh, gluconates are very effective at chelating iron. However, they are only effective as a chelator when you get above 1% caustic solutions. As far as membrane cleaning goes, gluconate chelators don't do us very much good, if any at all, because we can't get to the required pH or, or concentration of caustic required to activate the gluconate as an effective chelator. And that's that's really important is the pH. So trying to somehow you know achieve a combined effect of acidity and chelators, you can't do that in the same wash. So you need to have whatever your chelate is, it needs to be at its proper pH so that all of those hydroxides disassociate their hydrogen. So all of those O minuses in an acidic solution or a neutral solution, they're gonna have an H bound to them and they're gonna have no interest in calcium. It's not until you get uh, a high pH and all of those additional protons have been scavenged that it's going to be uh, extremely effective at, at hunting down and searching for those uh, metal ions. Solvents are another category. So in general, solvent is uh, water insoluble. However, there's a, a kind of this narrow band region of solvents that uh, have a similarity in some ways to surfactants where there is partially soluble in water um, and very soluble to and of fat. Um, so that's the common area where they're utilized is uh, use, used for if you have, um, most commonly, they, they're sort of like a reactive uh, sort of chemistry or trying to correct an issue. So if you've had a fine saver spillover upstream of an RO unit or some other way that fat has gotten to a system that's not supposed to have it, and so the normal wash is not set up to handle that amount, uh, or if somehow the amount of fat has just built up over time and hasn't been removed by the regular procedure, um, this might be integrated into that wash, but not for a very long period of time, because again, going back to the solubility uh, factor, these do have a tendency to degrade the membrane surface and make it more brittle, brittle over time. So um, most commonly used on sort of a recovery program. Uh, and uh, just keep in mind that if it's on a regular wash, might need to replace the membranes more consistently, more often or at least just check up on them to make sure that they're still functioning and, and not having a de degradation. I think, Glenn, you also mentioned that there's uh, an issue with the glue lines, uh, the glue and the membranes having a, a tendency to be uh, dissolved over time if these are used. Yeah, that's the, that's the main issue is if you overuse or abuse these products, they're a solvent, right? And they can soften it up. The membranes are essentially big hunks of thermoplastic elastomers or plastics. And solvents over time can can leach the plasticizers out of plastics or it can soften up glues. So gen generally, these are used on high fat units. 
and they're generally used in the first or maybe first and second washes, but not towards the end. And, it, it, and in the upfront washes of a system, we have so much soil in the system that a lot of times these things are help are you are helping to remove to suspend emulsify the fats and there's so much other soil that they, they don't really get a chance to attack the membranes so that's why if you if you are currently using ultrasol 580 on a daily basis don't be alarmed you don't need to pull it it's just that we're you're generally probably using it in the in the upfront washes where there's a lot of suspended soil so it's being tied up with that rather than uh, allowing to attack the glue or get to the membranes uh, sanitizing. Um, so sanitizing is a step that can and only can take place after an effective CIP. Uh, if we're thinking in terms of what the sanitizer is trying to do, it's trying to kill any remaining micro. Uh, it's not trying to take anything off the surface. And in fact, if there is anything left on the surface, uh, the sanitizer is going to react with that and it's going to never get to the micro. So any soil is going to work as essentially a shield to what you're trying to get rid of. Um, kind of pointless to conduct a sanitizing process if there's anything uh, remaining in the system as far as organic or um, any type of soiling. So selectrin is going to be membrane type dependent and that just simply means that uh, you're going to have to be a little bit more considerate of the uh, if you're using an RO versus a UF. Um, basically because the ROs, because of that thin film, are gonna be a lot more susceptible to uh, being degraded if you overuse or excessively use any of the oxidizing products. So our, it is an oxidizer, but uh, the, the most preferred uh, sanitizer is gonna be our hydroxy sand. So our parasitic acid products are going to be very effective at eliminating micro. And if they're used within their, um, minimal ranges so very short uh, sanitizing time and very low heat energy um, they're not going to be dig they're not going to degrade the membrane but um, for example if you have sort of a micro issue and people ramp up the use of these for a week or two on an ro unit just make sure they taper off um, and go back to maybe a weekly sanitize or switch to a non-oxidizing sanitizer so non-oxidizing sanitizers are also, um, that does exist, and these are going to be like your hydrosan. Um, uh, so hydrosan is going to be using actually a surfactant molecule in an acidic environment, which has some interesting antimicrobial effects. Uh, they are not going to have, as Glenn put it, uh, the ability to easily permeate those RO um, and nano membranes. So make sure that uh, if you're utilizing these, you start with a system that's at zero micro, uh, because uh, once you're once once you've got micro in the system, it's hard to eliminate it, especially with this type of a sanitizer. But the advantage of this type of sanitizer is you can run it on any system every day, and it's going to be deadly to micro without causing any negative or uh, degrading effects on your membrane surface. Now there is the option uh, in some cases to use a chlorine sanitizer. This is generally not recommended. Uh, just the fact that if it's not done correctly, you can have a degradation of membranes um, and also in some cases less efficacy than using multiple chemistries uh, on the same system in order to um, eliminate micro concerns. So there will be customers that approach you about doing this mainly from a cost perspective, but bear in mind uh, it, it's kind of a pay me now or pay me later situation, both from a product quality and from a membrane replacement standpoint. Um, so make sure that you, you know, try to bring us in uh, and um, generally just try not to, to get to that point. But uh, this is a potential option if, if all else, uh, if, if some people can't be talked out of it. Heat is one other way. Uh, this is, I, again, Glenn mentioned, kind of rare in the industry, but there are some people who have time uh, to go ahead and uh, do this heat sanitize. So some probably not every type of process, um, and it can take a lot of time, not just to reach temperature, but to heat up and cool down because as Glenn mentioned with the polymers, uh, you can sort of heat shock and break apart the membranes if you go up and down in temperature too fast. And just to that same effect, even 
uh, even those membranes have to be special. It can't just be any membrane that you do a heat sanitize on. Uh, so possibly a cost situation, but uh, in general, um, it, it, in general, it might be just as good to use a chemical sanitizer than to go through all the uh, complications of a heat sanitize. So do not conduct them chemically at high temperatures. This is going to increase the reactivity to too high for the membranes to tolerate, even at the right doses. Um, and then just speaking of doses, because this is an EPA registered sanitize, in order for it to be a legal sanitize, it has to be conducted within the proper rates. So soaks and preservatives are another type of chemistry that is utilized uh, as far as being bacteriostatic and also good for the membranes uh, for long term. Um, membranes like to be run. They don't like to sit, uh, but if they're going to sit, it's a lot better to sit them in, in some type of a proper solution than in water. Uh, so it's going to be important to keep them at the right pH. Um, and these are going to, again, sort of utilize those surfactants uh, and acidity to keep the micro count down. Or uh, in the case of membrane additive 531, they're going to have sulfites kind of like wine in order to protect it from any type of microbial growth that would attempt to be in the system. It's important to keep them uh, wet if they're going to be down. The membranes need to be circulated now and then. Uh, the vessels might not actually stay completely submerged in all locations. So making sure to can, you know, circulate them on a regular basis uh, is important. And any long-term soaks need to, um, they need to be, we're going to consult with the OEM. So if somebody's going to be down for a week or so, no problem, just throw in the soak and make sure that they're circulating. But if it's going to be longer than that, uh, we'd like to create a dialogue and a, a long-term storage plan. So time uh, is an interesting, component into the wash. Uh, if you go too long, you're going to hurt your membranes with some of the chemistry that's oxidizing or if it's got extreme pHs, but it is important to circulate long enough to do its job. Um, we've been looking into kind of what that optimum looks like by testing the accumulation of soil in membrane washes. Uh, we do not have enough data to make any sort of meta claims on how to throughout the industry change the amount of time that specific washes take. How seen in general that most washes are circulating for longer than they need to be. Um, we're in the process of trying to come up with a scalable model in order to test more of our customers' systems, um, but there, there will be future savings down the line for making this uh, a common trend to reduce time on washes. Uh, so heat is an important factor in, in many washes. You're going to increase your efficiency. So the amount of molecular interactions inside of your wash solution, uh, you still have to make sure to stay within that range for the membrane limitation. Um, but in general, if you can get the heat up, uh, it's going to make the chemistry work best. Uh, the system heaters, uh, if they're not large enough, um, there's some alternative options as far as increasing the amount of chemistry or the type of chemistry used. Lastly, the factors of cleaning. Rinsing is probably the most important part of the wash. So uh, chemistry is great, but if you have loose soils that the chemistry is working on, uh, you're going to be sort of counteracting and compromising yourself. And so we want to get those loose soils to a minimum before we even start adding chemistry. And in between each wash, especially between your alkaline and acid washes, we don't want to just be reacting our own chemistry against itself. So in order to have an efficiency of dosing, uh, we try to target getting as close to that neutral pH or the wash water pH before we move on to the next wash. But wish I had more time to harp on this. Rinsing, rinsing, rinsing is most important. And I understand that some people want to cut out some water and some time, and that's okay, but it needs to be done with a very close look at these factors, so the pH and the, the solids.